I'm sorry, Toad, but I'm afraid there's a heavy morning's work in front of you. You see, we really ought to have a banquet at once to celebrate this affair. It's expected of you. In fact, it's the rule. Oh, all right, said the Toad readily. Anything to oblige, though why on earth you should want to have a banquet in the morning, I cannot understand. But you know I do not live to please myself, but merely to find out what my friends want and then try and arrange it for them, you dear old badger. Don't pretend to be stupider than you really are, replied the badger crossly, and don't chuckle and splutter in your coffee while you're talking. It's not manners. What I mean is, the banquet will be at night, of course, but the invitations will have to be written and got off at once, and you've got to write them. Now sit down at that table, the stacks of letter paper on it with Toad Hall at the top in blue and gold, and write invitations to all of our friends. And if you stick to it, we shall get them out before luncheon. And I'll bear a hand too, and take my share of the burden. I'll order the banquet. What? cried Toad dismayed. Me? Stop indoors and write a lot of rotten letters on a jolly morning like this when I want to go round my property and set everything and everybody to rights and swagger about and enjoy myself? Certainly not. I'll be... I'll see you... Stop a minute, though. Why, of course, dear Badger, what is my pleasure or convenience compared with that of others? You wish it done, and it shall be done. Go, Badger, order the banquet, order what you like, then join your friends outside in their innocent mirth, oblivious of me and my cares and toils. I sacrifice this fair morning on the altar of duty and friendship. The Badger looked at him very suspiciously, but Toad's frank, open countenance made it difficult to suggest any unworthy motive in this change of attitude. He quitted the room accordingly in the direction of the kitchen, and as soon as the door had closed behind him, Toad hurried to the writing table. A fine idea had occurred to him while he was talking. He would write the invitations, and he would take care to mention the leading part he had taken in the fight, and how he had laid the chief weasel flat, and he would hint at his adventures, and what a career of triumph he had to tell about, and on the fly-leaf he would set out a sort of programme of entertainment for the evening, something like this as he sketched it out in his head. Speech by Toad there will be other speeches by Toad during the evening. Address by Toad. Synopsis. Our prison system. The waterways of old England. Horse dealing and how to deal. Property. Its rights and its duties. Back to the land. A typical English squire. Song by Toad. Composed by himself. Other compositions by Toad. Will be sung in the course of the evening by the composer. The idea pleased him mightily, and he worked very hard and got all the letters finished by, new by noon, at which hour it was reported to him that there was a small and rather bedraggled weasel at the door, inquiring tim timidly whether he could be of any service to the gentleman. Toad swaggered out and found it was one of the prisoners of the previous evening, very respectful and anxious to please. He patted him on the head, shoved the bundle of invitations into his paw and told him to cut along quick and deliver them as fast as he could and if he liked to come back again in the evening perhaps there might be a shilling for him or again perhaps there mightn't. And the poor weasel seemed really quite grateful and hurried off eagerly to do his mission. <clears throat> When the other animals came back to luncheon, very boisterous and breezy after a morning on the river, the mole, whose conscience had been pricking him, looked doubtfully at Toad, expecting to find him sulky or depressed. Instead, he was so uppish and inflated that the mole began to suspect something, while the rat and the badger exchanged significant glances. As soon as the meal was over, Toad thrust his paws deep into his trouser pockets, remarked casually, Well, look after yourselves, you fellows. Ask for anything you want, and was swaggering off in the direction of the garden, where he wanted to think out an idea or two for his coming speeches. 
when the rat caught him by the arm. Toad rather suspected what he was after and did his best to get away, but when the badger took him firmly by the other arm, he began to see that the game was up. The two animals conducted him between them into the small smoking room that opened out of the entrance hall, shut the door and put him into a chair. Then they both stood in front of him, while Toad sat silent and regarded, him, regarded them with much suspicion and ill humour. Now look here, Toad, said the rat. It's about this banquet, and very sorry I am to have to speak to you like this. But we want you to understand clearly, once and for all, that there are going to be no speeches and no songs. Try and grasp the fact that on this occasion we're not arguing with you, we are just telling you. Toad saw that he was trapped. They understood him. They saw through him. They had got ahead of him. His pleasant dream was shattered. Mayn't I sing them just one little song, he pleaded piteously. Not one little song, replied, repri replied the rat firmly, though his heart bled as he noticed the trembling lip of the poor disappointed toad. It's no good, Toady. You know well that your songs are all conceit and boasting and vanity, and your speeches are all self-praise and, and well, and gross exaggeration. And, and, and gas put in the badger in his common way. It's for your own good, Toady, went on the rat. You know you must turn over a new leaf sooner or later, and now seems a splendid time to begin, a sort of turning point in your career. Please don't think that saying all this doesn't hurt me more than it hurts you. Toad remained a long while plunged in thought. At last he raised his head, and the traces of strong emotion were visible on his features. You have conquered, my friends, he said in broken accents. It was, to be sure, but a small thing that I asked, merely to leave, to merely leave to blossom and expand for yet one more evening, to let myself go and hear the tumultuous applause that always seems to me somehow to bring out my best qualities. However, you are right, I know, and I am wrong. Henceforth, I will be a very different toad. My friends, you shall never have occasion to blush for me again. But, oh dear, oh dear, this is a hard world. And pressing his handkerchief to his face, he left the room with faltering footsteps. Badger, said the rat, I feel like a brute. I wonder what you feel like. Oh, I know, I know, said the badger gloomily, but the thing had to be done. This good fellow has got to live here and hold his own and be respected. Would you have him a common laughing stock, mocked and jeered, by, at, and jeered at by stoats and weasels? Of course not, said the rat. And talking of weasels, it's lucky we came upon that little weasel just as he was setting out with Toad's invitations. I suspected something from what you told me and had a look at one or two. They were simply disgraceful. I confiscated the lot and the, and the good mole is now sitting in the blue boudoir filling up plain, simple invitation cards. At last, the hour for the banquet began to draw near and Toad, who on leaving the others, had retired to his bedroom and was still sitting there melancholy and thoughtful. His brow resting on his paw, he pondered long and deeply. Gradually his countenance cleared and he began to smile long, slow smiles. Then he took to giggling in a shy, self-conscious manner. At last he got up, locked the door, drew the curtains across the windows, collected all the chairs in the room and arranged them in a semicircle and took up his position in front of them, swelling visibly. Then he bowed, 
coughed twice and letting himself go with uplifted voice he sang to the enraptured audience that his, that his imagination so clearly saw.